They say you're the one we're looking for. <clears throat> the one that'll do what's necessary. And that was a scene from The Splinter Cell, an awesome fan film from Atomic Productions which was released in late 2014 and just happened to be one of the first major uses of HitFilm 3 Pro's new projector effect. I'm Simon Jones from HitFilm.com. Today I'm going to be looking at using the projector effect to create simple 3D sets from 2D images. In this tutorial you're going to transform this still image of a field into this establishing shot complete with a 3D camera move. Let's take a closer look at the finished shot. Note how the grassy field shifts perspective as the camera moves, even though this is based off a simple flat 2D photo. If I switch to the perspective view, you can see what's actually going on. There are two planes positioned in 3D space. This one represents the field, and this one at the back represents the line of trees. The projector effect has been applied to both of these planes, and it's the projector which is taking the still image and warping it onto the 3D planes. Viewed from above, you can see how the image has been stretched and distorted onto the floor plane, but as I move around to the point of view of the camera, you can see that the distortion effectively disappears. It's a similar concept to advertisements painted on football pitches, which are distorted in such a way as to only look correct from the TV camera's point of view. If you want to follow along with this tutorial, first download the project files, which include the still image that I'm working from. You should find the link below. The image was sourced from littlevisuals.co, a great website of free public domain stock images. Make sure you bookmark that one. Launch HitFilm 3 Pro and create a new project. I'm going to go for a 2K DCI project at 24 frames per second, but you can use whatever you're used to. It doesn't really matter for this particular tutorial. I'll click Start Compositing, which will automatically create a new composite shot timeline ready for some visual effects work. The first thing to do is import the still image with the import button or simply by dragging it in from a folder window. I'll add it from the media panel to the composite shot one timeline. I'm actually going to rename my composite shot by opening its settings. I'll call it final shot. I'll also reduce its duration to five seconds because we don't need this to be 30 seconds long. I'm currently using the editing workspace, which is what dictates the layout of all my panels and containers here. Because I'm working specifically on a visual effects shot, I'm actually going to go up to the workspaces menu and switch over to the compositing workspace. This adjusts the layout to be better suited for comp work. Zooming out with the mouse wheel, I'll select the image, then hold shift and drag on the corner points to resize it until it's about the same width as the frame. It doesn't have to be exact. Holding shift makes sure that the aspect ratio remains the same and you don't end up stretching the image in weird dimensions. This still image will be what we project onto the planes, so it's kind of equivalent to a film strip that you'd load into a real projector. I'll now create a new plane from the new layer menu on the timeline. I'll call it screen and set it to a 4096 by 3112 so it's nice and big. I've called it screen because it will be performing the same function as a real cinema screen i.e. displaying whatever is being projected from the projector. The colour doesn't really matter at this point, but I'll just go with the preset grey for now. If you look in the media panel, you'll find that the plane is now available, called Screen. This is useful because we'll be using it several times. On the timeline, I can now rename this particular instance of the plane without changing the original. So I'll select the layer, hit F2, and then rename it to Field. Currently this plane is just 2D, so I'll click on the dimension icon and switch it over to 3D. This will automatically add a new 3D camera. Depending on your HitFilm setup, you might be asked to confirm that, so if you get that, just click OK. The plane is currently right up in our faces, so let's fix that. In the Layers Transform properties, I'll change its X orientation to 90, which flips it around so that it's flat. I can now use the controls in the viewer to move the layer around. For this shot, I want this layer to be the grassy field, so I'm going to move the layer down until its farthest edge is more or less aligned with the bottom of this brick wall at the back of the image. To make it easier to see what's going on, head into the effects panel and add the grid effect to the field layer. This will give a quick visualization of the 3D set you're creating. We now need to create our tree line. To do this, I'm going to duplicate the field layer by selecting it and pressing Ctrl D. This new layer I'll rename to Trees. In its transform properties, I'll switch the orientation back to zero so that it's standing up again. 
This layer now needs to be moved back in 3D space to align with the back edge of the field layer. To do this, I'll switch the viewer to two views, with the left one being my active camera and the right one being a top view. I can now simply push the tree layer back until it's in position. I'll also switch to the front view and move the layer up a bit so that the bottom edge is aligned as well. Switching back to the perspective view, you can see that these two layers are now in position and ready to receive the projection. I'm going to move this container by dragging the empty section of its title bar and drop it down here. That's simply so that I can have a larger viewer area. Don't forget you can customise your interface whenever you want and you can save it as a new workspace if you find it useful. Right, now it's time to add the projector effect. I'll do the field layer first. After adding the projector from the effects panel, I'll also switch off the grid effect as it's not needed anymore. In the projector's controls, I'll set projection from to the source image. You can see in the perspective view that it's not quite right. All it's doing at the moment is projecting the 2D image onto the plane like it's some kind of 3D clipping window. That's because we still need to set up our projection camera. The composite shot currently has just a single camera. I'm going to rename this camera to main. This camera is the one I'll be using to create the shot itself. What I now need is a second camera to act as my actual projector. So I'll duplicate the camera layer with Ctrl D and rename the duplicate to static. I'll move this down in the layer list so that it's next to the source layer. That's mostly just to keep things tidy. So think of the static camera as being equivalent to a real projector. In a cinema setup, you wouldn't ever want the projector itself to be moving because, well, that would be utterly rubbish for the audience who's trying to watch the movie. It's the same thing here. So back in the projector controls for our field layer, I'll set the camera option to use our static camera. You can now see that the projection has been distorted in the perspective view. Meanwhile, over in the active camera, it still looks correct because from that point of view, the distortion creates the correct original result that you see in the photo. Because we're using a 2D layer as our projector source, the effect considers the source to be attached directly to the static camera, just like if you had a film strip loaded into a real projector. Let's set up the tree line before we start moving our camera around. In the field layer, I'll select the projector effect and copy it with Ctrl C. Then I'll select the trees layer and paste the effect onto it with Ctrl V. I'll also need to turn off the grid again on this layer. So in the active camera view, the image now looks completely normal because our main camera is in the exact same position as our static camera. And remember, the static camera is determining what is being projected. However, over in the perspective view, you can see that we now have the image projected onto our two 3D planes. If I now use the camera controls in the active camera view to push the camera forwards, or indeed in any other direction, you can see the perspective begin to shift. In the perspective view, note how the main camera is now in a different position from the static camera. Don't forget that the active camera is always the highest one on the timeline, which is why the controls are affecting the main camera and not our static camera. As the main camera is moved around, we get this 3D perspective shift. I can actually turn off the source layer's visibility because it doesn't need to be visible at any point in the render. There are, of course, limitations to this technique. If you move your main camera too much, you run the risk of seeing the edges of the projection. Equally, if you push the projection too far, you'll start to see obvious stretching or tearing in the result. Where this technique's most useful is for creating subtle establishing shots. It's why it's a good idea to get lots of stills photography of your sets and locations. It means that if you realise halfway through your edit that you could really have done with that extra establishing shot or a mood shot of your location, you can actually create it digitally, complete with a subtle 3D camera move. This is why projection was used for that splinter cell shot I showed you at the start. The actual shot of the camera moving up the corridor had never been filmed. That was a shot that was kind of conceived in post. So I was able to take a still image of that location and turn it into a fairly convincing 3D space. So back to the field shot. I'm now going to turn on keyframing for the main camera's position property, then shift that keyframe to the end of the timeline. I'll then move our camera up on frame zero, creating a simple camera move. You can create whatever kind of camera move you want, but remember, Generally with projection, you want to keep the camera move fairly subtle. The more subtle the camera move, the more realistic it's going to look, and the better the effect itself is going to hold up. One thing that's not quite right about this field shot is that the sky is evidently part of the same layer as the trees, whereas there should be a bit of parallax shift going on there, because the sky is obviously further away than the trees. So let's quickly fix that using some of HitFilm's other effects and features. 
I'm going to select the source layer and duplicate it with Control D. I'll then hit the Make Composite Shot button and call the new composite shot Tree Line Matte. This creates a new timeline with just that layer inside. Inside that new comp, I'll turn the source layer on and then I'll go into the effects library and find the chroma key effect. This I will add to the image. So up in the controls panel, I'll now use the color picker to select the blue of the sky, sampling from somewhere fairly close to the tree line because that's where the important bit is. What we want is a nice detailed key on the trees. Switching to the chroma key matte view makes it easy to see what exactly is going on. I'll increase the gain until most of the sky and clouds have disappeared, and then I'll clip the foreground a bit as well to create a more solid tree line. I'll then use the Rectangle Mask tool to draw a quick shape over these lingering clouds. I'll invert the mask using this button on the timeline, and I'm done. Quick and dirty, but it will do the job. Don't forget to switch the chroma key view back to result when you're done, otherwise you'll end up with a really peculiar alpha view. Alright, I'll switch back to the final shot using the tabs on the timeline, and I'll switch off the tree line matte layer's visibility, just like the source layer, we don't need to actually see it. And then we'll go into the trees layer's projector settings, which we set up earlier. But I'm now going to update the projection from setting to use the new tree line matte layer instead of the original source. This means that the trees layer is using that keyed out version of the background with the sky removed. I can now set up the sky as a separate layer. So I'll select the source layer and duplicate it again, renaming it to sky. I'll move this up in the layer list to be underneath the trees layer and we'll turn it back on so it's actually visible. Currently it's just a 2D layer, so it doesn't move at all when we move our camera, because 2D layers don't interact with 3D cameras. I'll now switch over to 3D, and then use the top view to shift the layer back in 3D space to be behind the trees layer. You don't need to go too far back, just enough to get a little bit of parallax shift going on there. Now because I've pushed the layer so far back, it's no longer actually filling the screen. So I'll scale it up until no black edges are visible anymore. I'll also just drop it down a bit in the frame to make sure that we don't glimpse the trees in the sky layer. We now have a little bit of subtle parallax going on with the sky as the camera moves. Combined with the perspective shift on the ground created by the projector effect, this is working as a pretty convincing shot. And because it's based on a real photo, you can actually get surprisingly photoreal results with minimal efforts. Because this now exists as a 3D space, you get some added benefits. For example, I could go up here, select the text tool and create a new text layer. I'll type in something exceedingly obvious, like projector, and let's make it nice and big and chunky. I can now set the text to be 3D down on the timeline, and I can position it anywhere I want within our little set. It then just works in relation to everything else and gives you some really interesting compositing options, which if you were just trying to composite straight onto our original flat photo, you wouldn't really be able to do this in the same way. You'd have to fill around with masks and doing all sorts of shortcuts and tricks. Um, but because we've created the 3D set, you can now position the text wherever you want and it's just going to work. Uh, if I switch over into this pre-made composite shot, you can see that I've added lights and shadows to the text. This is easy to do because we've already created our 3D set. We have a surface that the text can cast a shadow onto, so we've kind of done half the work already. You can even turn the camera's depth of field feature on to add some shallow doff to your shot. We can then rack the focus backs and forwards, giving a kind of interesting miniature look to the photo. Projector gives you a lot of flexibility. This tutorial has covered a really simple but quite effective example. You can, of course, create more complex shots. Take a look at this awesome shot, for example, created by TreeM23 on the hitfilm.com forums, in which he's managed to integrate 3D models with a projected 3D corridor set. If you didn't know because I just told you, you probably wouldn't guess that the background is entirely projected. Okay, so this tutorial is just part one of our look at the projector effect. There's lots more you can do with it, from projecting other 2D effects onto 3D surfaces, and even using it to remove objects from a moving camera shot. If you want to catch parts 2 and 3, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel or our newsletter to stay up to date with our latest videos. Many thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next one. Can I count you in?